Okay, so let's get into this. So our first panel is going to be the next generation and the new mayor. So I'm gonna ask our next generation to come forward. Tatiana Matthews from Atlanta Technical College. Acosta Pliego from Georgia Institute of Technology. Erica Denman from Georgia State University. Jasmine Wilson from Clark Atlanta University. Neha Murthy from Emory University. And A.J. Powell from SCAD. Now, I don't have to introduce our mayor, but I, I will. <laughs> He's our 61st mayor of Atlanta. Prior to becoming mayor, he served as an at-large city council member for two terms. In addition to serving in public office, Mayor Dick Dickens has been a businessman, a nonprofit executive, is an engineer, a deacon, a father, and a native Atlantan. <laughs> his career follows his passions and his impact follows his commitment. Dickens is a member of the Georgia Tech Alumni Board of Directors, an alumnus of Leadership Atlanta, Diversity Leadership Atlanta, United Way, VIP, Regional Leadership Institute, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, um, and is a deacon of New Horizon Baptist Church. He is a product of Atlanta Public Schools and is a graduate of Mays High School. My children went there. And he earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a master's of public administration degree in economic development from Georgia State University. Please welcome Mayor Andrew, Andre Dickens. I'm gonna lose my job. <laughs> Andre, hey. Andre. Hey, Andre. I'm Camille. <laughs> okay, so the mayor is going to respond to these students' ideas about some issues in Atlanta, and they want to know where are we going, Mr. Mayor. All right. Okay, so the first one will be Tatiana Matthews. She's a May 22 graduate of the dental hygiene program at Atlanta Technical College. Tatiana hopes to help motivate and inspire the next generation to go after their true passion through the route of technical education as an alternative to the traditional four-year post-secondary education. Tatiana. Hi, and thank you for having me. I would like to um, start off by saying that, um, that with Allied Health, I'd like to think of it as um, a subgroup to the healthcare system. Um, right now, the minority makes up about 20% of the allied health ver um, portion of the healthcare system. That would be your dental hygienist, your dental assistants, pharmacy technicians. Um, and personally, from learning from my field, uh, minorities only make up about 5% of dental um, in its totality. Um, what I hope to do in the um, near future is how can we motivate the generation that's coming up as well as us. I look at us as leaders because we are graduating around this time, so people look to us. How can we influence and motivate them and encourage them to be a part of the healthcare system and the allied health system within it to build that society trust? Um, because as minorities, uh, we have not had the best experience um, traditionally with the healthcare system. And right now during a time of the pandemic, right now is very challenging to get people to believe in the better half or what the healthcare system is really trying to do. So in the near future, how, how can we get healthcare or how can we build a society trust within the healthcare system besides influencing the next generation to go into health? Yeah, thank you, Tatiana, uh, for that question. And um, thank you for your work uh, so far uh, in public health. Um, there's several answers I offer up to that. Um, one is um, related to exposure for young people. Um, this summer, we're gonna have 3,000 youth employed across the city of Atlanta. Some of them will work for the city, but some of them are gonna work for law firms, doctor's offices, uh, dentistry, um, as well as veterinarians. So as youth profess who they want to be, they can go on our portal 
and find jobs that they can have th this summer that will pay them uh, 12 to $16 an hour, depending on your age, ninth grade through 12th grade uh, and beyond, to have an internship and a summer job uh, in a career of your choice. Uh, so that's part of the exposure. Not only do you see it on TV or in the, uh, on, a, on a phone, but we want you to have real life exposure, particularly as you communicated about minority youth. Um, you know, it's hard to be it when you don't see it. A number of us don't have, um, you know, doctors or, you know, dentists in our family. So how do you aspire to be it and do you really know what it is? So this summer we're going to, this summer and next summer we're going to try to do a lot in the, in the um, realm of exposure. Another thing is um, we got to, you know, expand Medicaid, um, not to get way too political. That's not a city issue, but I mean, that's not a city, we don't, you know, that's not a city law, but that's a, a state law. So, you know, choose your governor wisely. Um, <clears throat> one did not the access to health care. Another is pro a, a huge proponent of it, as well as our state uh, as well as our U.S. Senator Warnock, so I would, I would uh, encourage that as well. Um, last but not least, you know, part of my mission statement that I wrote as mayor, the vision is to have a city of safe, healthy, connected neighborhoods. Healthy neighborhoods are vital and very important. Far too often, minority communities don't have access to good public health, um, and that comes in the form of fresh food. Uh, food deserts are a part of our health indicators uh, and, and, and uh, having doctor's offices and um, not using the emergency room as your primary health care. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to talk about how we develop the south side, the west side of this city to make sure that, uh, that we have fresh food, that we also have access to health is very important um, going forward so that we catch these things before they become um, true emergencies. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Daisy Acosta Pliego, a May, 20, May 2022 graduate with a BS in architecture from Georgia Tech. Daisy is a first generation Mexican American who grew up in Georgia, proudly serving as VP of the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students this past year. Daisy? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. Um, I wrote down my thoughts on my phone, so I'll read it out now. But um, tonight, we asked the next generation of students, where are we going? Well, I'm here to offer my perspective after four long but worthwhile years of architecture school. Beyond providing shelter, architecture has the unique ability to become a stage set for our lives. I learned of the churches where activists, such as the Black Panther Party, set up their headquarters and carried out basic public services for the people, such as their free breakfast programs and health clinics. I also learned about public architecture in Brazil, whose sole purpose is to exist for the community, such as Lina Bobardi Social Service Centers. These examples have helped me shape what it means to become an architect and how I can use what I learned to advocate for the best interests of people. I learned not only from history, but also from communities around the world and the ways they have used their own architecture as a tool. For example, there's a little, there's a little city in France called Grigny, and they have created lifelong education programs utilizing schools when not in use. And these programs allow for anyone, such as those who maybe had to drop out or adults who don't have the time during the day, to continue their education. These programs were made possible through the participation of both the community and local power, such as the mayor. I believe local elected representatives have a role in the conversation regarding the best interest for people and by recognizing an existing infrastructure such as schools or churches and coordinating with the community um, and local powers, we can make public spaces more deeply public and for the people. So from all this, what can we learn from this and how can we implement it in, in Atlanta? By using architecture in unconventional ways and furthering collaboration with the community and the mayor, we can begin to rethink how we use our built environment to further the experience of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Go Jackets. Georgia Tech, right? Go Jackets. Um, the first answer to how is we sound like we should listen to you. Um, <laughs> you you uh, have a great perspective on, on, on the value of architecture in the public space. Um, I share that. And I think that um, Atlanta has to uh, con uh, continue to push the envelope as it relates to design 
And we've talked about that in terms of buildings that people wanted to build along the Beltline and in some of our other areas that just were uninspiring. Um, and we, as a city council at the time, now I'm mayor, we had to tell these architects, uh, tell some of these developers, that that's not inspiring. So we have a design review commission now uh, that we stood up uh, under our urban planning, uh, under our city planning and our uh, urban design group. Um, that just, uh, Melody knows this, like we, we're just really not accepting any old thing just to fill the city's um, spa you know, vacant lots. And so um, one other thing that I say besides the checks and balances of trying to make sure that developers don't give us cheap buildings that, that won't inspire and actually won't add value to our skyline um, and won't add value to the image of Atlanta. I'm a huge proponent of Atlanta being on the international stage and being able to uh, inspire people with our public art as well as just the, the, the way the city feels and looks. And when they don't use proper architecture um, or not use uh, inspiring architecture to be able to um, appeal to folks, then you undersell the city of Atlanta. Um, another thought about this is how valuable my experience was with architecture when I first heard of who John Portman was and looking at Hyatt Regency and um, the uh, Marriott Marquis, those iconic atrium style hotels. Well, think about this. I had never, I didn't see those spaces until I was in, uh, you know, I was out of tech. So what happens when you are a minority or a young person of low, you know, you don't have, you don't feel like you belong in some of these places. Architecture should be inspiring and also inviting. And so now I think that with voices like yours and others, being able to tell youth to go out there and see buildings, walk into the lobbies, uh, you do not have to pay for a hotel night to be able to experience the grand lobbies of some of these hotels. You do not have to buy a ticket to initially walk into the front of the Woodruff Art Center, walk into the front of um, the High Museum to be able to get an understanding and a feel for it. So I created this app called Passport, Passport Atlanta, and we're trying to get it off the ground, but it's going to be really what we're talking about, where youth will be able to, for free, access um, a lot of things that this city has and to be able to learn more about our history, but also about the architecture and the space, uh, public spaces that we have. But thank you, I'd like to, you know, work with you on that and you can have an internship at the city of Atlanta this summer if you want. <laughs> okay, Mayor Dickens, I think there's five others who are gonna be oh. looking for internships this Oh, summer. yeah, okay. here I go. <laughs> All right, All and I'm gonna shorten my answers so I don't give away everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Erica Denman, a senior French major and political science minor at Georgia State University. Um, Erica is a mother to a nearly two-year-old son, lives in Stone Mountain, Georgia. We have to get you in Atlanta, Eric. Erica. Uh, she has recently accepted a position with a humanitarian aid organization to satisfy her goals of providing help to others. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me this evening and for hearing all of us out. Um, and so in selecting French and political science, my goals were pretty clear that I wanted to be able to assist other people. Um, I understand the importance of interacting and engaging with politicians, um, with legislative representatives, and also being able to have that widespread reach to minority communities. Uh, French is a language that is spoken by a lot of refugees, a lot of immigrants. Um, it's not just France and Europe, uh, which I love, but I also love the many other communities that speak French. Um, so the direction that I see Atlanta going is, is I wanna see us in a place of inclusion where we do allow refugees, immigrants, lower income communities, single mothers, um, you know, people of color to have access to the same opportunities that um, people who already have a little bit of privilege have access to. Uh, there are very obvious barriers that exist, um, such as transportation, childcare, housing, and education. 
I think that the two that I see the most and that um, I connect with the most are probably going to be education and housing. Um, I have been fortunate enough to have access to education, but in, in the work that I have recently started doing, I am seeing the barriers that exist for other people. I work with a lot of um, low English level uh, refugees and immigrants, and there's also the issue of the cost of education and services. Um, I, I appreciate that there are vocational training programs like TechBridge, <laughs> that is that is very helpful, and uh, I appreciate the targeting minority communities with that. But I would still like to see a an Atlanta that is more welcoming and that is focusing on removing those barriers to opportunity. All right, um, merci beaucoup. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bonjour. <laughs> Je suis an Atlantan, that's it, that's it. Miss Anderson at Mays High School, uh, took some French, took some French. My daughter's taking French now. Um, so one, I uh, agree with what you're saying. We want to be a uh, sanctuary city. We want to be a welcoming city. And, and then, you know, on top of that, we really want to, my ideals is that Atlanta operates as a region so you're in Stone Mountain, so, the, so your lens is both DeKalb County, Stone Mountain, as well as Atlanta. We want to be a welcoming region. Um, Atlanta's a small dot. You know, we're 10% of the metropolitan area's land mass, by the way. Atlanta's small. You got a lot more beyond Atlanta, but I'm going to do my part here and also uh, expand using, you know, the voice of the mayor of the, of the heartbeat of the region. Um, but, I, but I think that what we're talking about is how to make sure that not only what happens in Atlanta, because we have an Office of Immigrant Affairs, we have an Office of International Affairs, we have staff that goes out and feeds and helps, and we have bilingual offerings on, um, and multilingual offerings on our website for um, all the pro, you know, a number of the programs that we have. We need to do a better job, we need to expand more and offer more. Uh, I also want us to do that regionally, though. Um, you know, the cost of living in Atlanta as a city proper has risen substantially. I'm a huge advocate for affordable housing. Some of the metropolitan counties and regions surrounding us, you know, their cost of living is not as high. So that is, that does become a place that can be helpful in this conversation about providing housing opportunities. And here she is right here. Here's uh, Vanessa Ibarra, who's over these offices that I just mentioned. Thank you for being so timely. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but the other thing I would say is one universal need for all of us that have children is, um, you know, is to have early childhood education that you can afford, childcare. So, so much of the cost that people bear each, each month, your housing, your transportation, and then childcare. And, and, and of course, if you have medical conditions, your medicine and food, but childcare, has gotten way out of control and is extremely expensive. So that's why my administration, we're the first to ever commit $5 million to early childhood education for kids zero to four. Because you, you know people go to work and they still have to do, what do you do with your child each day? Well, it's so expensive. And so we're committing $5 million from the city's budget. That's the first time we've ever committed money for early childhood education. We have a whole school system, and the school system takes you from K through, K through 12, and, and, but, but what happens before that K? There's pre-K, and then there's preschool, and all this other stuff. And so we, 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 went, we said, what the goal is 20 million, and so the Whitehead Foundation is committing another uh, 5 million on top of our 5 million, and we're coming at others to ask for it, and what we're going to do with that money is pay for people, is basically give scholarships to low-income people to pay for their childcare, as well as our employees of the city and airport workers, because it's so expensive to, every dollar that you make, you end up, you know, sending it right to childcare, housing, and you don't really have a, a quality of life. So for, whether that's for people that are seeking refuge in America and chose our city, um, they also need these services. And so that's my first stab at being thoughtful about how we support communities uh, uh, that are coming to Atlanta and those communities that are already here. Thank you. Okay, Jasmine Wilson is a writer, 
a scholar and a curator from Atlanta, Georgia. She just got her master's in African American Studies from Clark Atlanta University, where she completed her thesis, The African Symbolism of Simone Lee's Brick House Sculpture. Jasmine? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Huh? Speak up a little bit. All right. Um, thank you for having me tonight and to everyone involved with this beautiful project dedicated to the arts. I am so grateful for your efforts. Um, much like my peers on this panel, I have many ideas about the future of Atlanta in regards to our youth. I currently work as the graduate assistant at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art and am witnessing some amazing things happening within the Atlanta University Center related to the digitization of the fine art collection at Clark Atlanta University's museum, the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective, which is a program dedicated to training the next generation of museum and art professionals. And just this week, um, there was an announcement regarding the establishment of a Center for Innovation in Art um, in honor of the retirement of Spelman's president, Dr. Campbell. So there's already a number of things happening, specifically within the HBCU community around art um, innovation and technology but as a native of Atlanta um, I'm always thinking about the pathways for our youth to enter these institutions uh, with a sense of preparedness and we, unfortunately we do not have a school dedicated to the arts in the city of Atlanta um, while there are schools in the metro area, Pebble Brook High School, DeKalb School of the Arts, et cetera, um, my vision and dream would be to see a school that fosters the development and richness within our youth, the creators of this culture that Atlanta um, is so proud of. And I'm curious as to how we might get there. Thank you, Jasmine, for that question. Um, and that's a great way to phrase a question. How will we get there? Um, so one, um, you're sitting next to, or you were sitting on the stage with, um, who's been really at the forefront in the helm of uh, cultural affairs for the city of Atlanta for some time now. We don't want to give this young lady's <laughs> time, sir. Is that so? Couple few, couple few years, um, but um, someone like uh, Camille Love and her experience is something I, I lean on inside of City Hall. But we're taking it a step further by working with a number of individuals right here that um, they got their cameras out, they're recording me every word I say because they, they, they want to make sure I get it right with them. But these individuals right here are um, a part of a collective of folks that. Um, really advocate on behalf of the arts of this city and the artists of this city and really the culture of who Atlanta is. Some back in the back, actually they're all over as I look out. Um, and I'm responsive to them and you, and you. Um, I know that um, what I want is to make sure that the city is, um, a world-class city has world-class art. It has an art scene. It has art and as, um, as part of its um, you know, uh, appeal. People want to come to see the art. And the art isn't just in a museum, although it should be. But art is on the streets and murals. Arts are in the, um, on the public um, transportation, on the buses, on the trains. Art is you know, throughout our, you know, you know, even on the roads, on the streets, on the sidewalks. Uh, art should be um, you know, inspiring you and also challenging the norms. And so I believe that um, we, we identify the North Star together as to what we want to see. We should have an arts district. We've talked about that, uh, making sure that, I mean, we have some pockets of art districts, but we need to have something that's more 
you know, um, formalized, uh, formalized as an art district. It's going to take money. It's going to take planning. Um, so we're going to be looking at that uh, in detail. Uh, art should be funded from the city's coffers and the county's coffers. And um, yeah. And so if you paid any attention to our most recent budget, um, we've increased the arts budget for the city by 25% uh, this very first year of my administration. So we're doing that. Yep. And um, there was a loan, a loan fund that was out there for a million dollars. Only 110,000 of it had been loaned out. So it's $890,000 left, but it's in loans. And this is how being attentive, this is, this is actually good, good lessons. Um, so well-intended people created a loan fund for the art, but for artists. But the challenge is artists didn't want to use a loan fund. They wanted grants. And so we just converted that last 890000 into grants so that we can get what we actually want, which is the art and the artists being taken care of. So you'll see that um, as a product of me listening, as a product of me listening, as a product of me trying to make sure that, you know, it's not just a piggy bank. When you put this money out there, that's what government do. We don't, we, I'm not an artist by any stretch. So we employ and we advocate and we express that we want this. But when you set the money out there as a budget and you look, walk away and you come back and you're like, the money's still there, then you have to, you know, make some adjustments as to how to de deliver that. And so the delivery mechanism moves from a loan to now it's going to be grants and so many other mechanisms. So when you say how, a little bit of it is money, a little bit of it is space, a little bit of it is the voice of the mayor, and a little bit of it is a bunch of um, collaboration. Thank you. All right. Neha Murthy is a rising junior at Emory University, obtaining her degrees in quantitative social science with a concentration in biological anthropology and French. I guess she didn't have enough to do over there. <laughs> <laughs> in just her one year on Emory's campus, she has been elected by the students to serve as their next vice president of the student body. Meha. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to share the stage with my peers and, of course, our esteemed mayor. Um, Today I want to talk about my vision of the future in terms of tech, but specifically in healthcare. Um, today we are in an age where specialized cancer treatments are becoming a thing, and doctors are able to produce targeted treatments for patients based off of the patient's individual genomes and their genetics, which is like, I find this incredible. And um, I think it's, it's just um, breathtaking how we have the technology to be able to almost treat everyone based off of like their DNA and who they are and provide more care for them. But um, I do acknowledge the struggles to this, that right now this is not available for all cancer treatments. This is, genetic testing is extremely expensive. And most of these tri treatments are available in like research and clinical trials at the moment. But um, looking forward, I hope to see um, the healthcare system where we are able to help every indi individual based off of their genetics, but um, something that's more affordable and accessible to all. Um, I see us as a society going forth being um, based off of sound data and also being a society where we value research. Um, so I hope to see research being founded or like driven more by the question of what is ethical, being exactly what drives us in this search for genetics and ethics. So um, this is kind of just open-ended, I guess, how we can use ethics to drive genetics and the future of healthcare and technology. You are smart. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, man, stump the mayor contest up here today. <laughs> Um, so what, what, I, what I'll tell you is I don't know a whole lot about everything that you just mentioned. Um, but one thing I will tell you I know is the value of data. I'm an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer. And, um, and I'm a, you know, te in, in technology, prior to them electing me mayor, I was in technology. Um, and the value in data, the value in being data-driven in our decision-making about everything, uh, most things, I would say, um, and particularly as it comes to health, 
Um, and for me, I think that um, ethics looks like um, looks like uh, justice, looks like uh, fairness. And so, as we're whoever's going to create these treatments, whoever's going to create these um, these um, genome tracing and all these things that are you know beyond my scope, but my desire is that they do it with fairness, justice. And that means that they need to have people that um, push them in that direction to guide them and make sure that the, the voice of the least of these is heard. That is, you know, cancer is um, so costly. Cancer is so costly financially and on society in general that um, whatever, whatever DNA they need, they're going to need to get it from low-income people as well as high-income people. They're going to need to get it from brown people and um, lighter than brown people and darker than brown people um, in our politically correct way of saying things. Um, you don't have to get it from everybody. And so what I would say is I want to make sure that the data got everybody in the data so that the trials that we're included, that we're incentivized to participate in them, um, that you don't make a case for those that are in your office right now with the ability to pay, but you make a case for those that are in your that, that couldn't make it to your office because they you know they don't have the money to even make it to your office. So what it looks like for me is whenever that time comes that these things are available to my knowledge set that I make sure that it's broad and and accessible and also um, encourage everybody's participation in it. Um, so that's what ethics looks like to me. Hey, don't do what she just did now. That was hard. <laughs> you handled it well. You did a good job, Mayor Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. And finally, we get to this gentleman on the stage, Alan Jayon Powell, also known as AJ, American fine artist born in Memphis, Tennessee. I want to give my condolences to the Memphis Grizzlies. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, AJ is pursuing a BFA in painting at SCAD, Atlanta, being especially influenced by the bold colors and graphic lines of trained graffiti. His larger-than-life portraits are inspired by people, both famous and in his personal life. Oh, um, I have slides, too. It's like a quick slide. <laughs> Just a little quick slide. <laughs> now they're all like, dang it! I should have brought, brought my slides. You could have showed me the human genome slide. <laughs> okay. Good evening and thank you, Mr. Mayor and distinguished guests. My name is Alan J. M. Powell and I am an artist. I study painting and fashion design at Savannah College of Art and Design, where I spend my days exploring color. How can it be used? What does it mean, and how it translates to his viewer? Can you go to the next slide for me? <laughs> <laughs> I also like to go to the rooftop and scat and look at the city and wonder, how will Atlanta influence me, and how will I influence Atlanta? In no, 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 that's, no, no, that's it. <laughs> in, uh, in, in preparation for tonight. I had an experience of driving down Peachtree Street, coming past Gatway, and I came across a mural, a mural that Joe King was in the process of working on, and he's an alumni student. This made me think about, oh, he, was also in the, he, he was also still in the progress of working on it as well. This made me think about what else was still in progress, young artists, young people, and even me, seeing public art and just being inspired. I think we see ourselves in the leaders that inspire us. For example, The Dream. Can you go to the next slide for me? <laughs> the Dream has inspired me to be the best that I can be because he goes to SCAD studying fashion design and he has reached the highest limit in the music industry. And it made me think about myself. Where do I want to go? And where are, where are we going and where is Atlanta going? I want to explain it in just a little story. So I was walking in the park, and I came up across 
a flower. And I thought about the process of the flower. You have to plant the seed, and you have to water the flower and protect the flower in order to see it grow. And I compared that to Atlanta. I feel from my perspective, from an artist's perspective, I think that creative artists brings more creative interest, creative, creative artwork brings more creative people, and creative ideas would bring the community together as one. And to sum that up, it made me realize that elevated art equals an elevated society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good man. Beautifully said. Hey, AJ Mama. <laughs> AJ Mama. <laughs> um, so, uh, AJ, first of all, you, you're not just an aspiring artist. From what I see, you are an artist. You are, you are awesome. Uh, th that um, that I just saw there, you know, really good, really good. And there's some people in this room that um, they're, they're just a few years older than you, like Fahamu and Fabian and um, some others, uh, Ashley, and some others that are here that uh, do murals. But um, you're well on your way from where you just started. And um, I know you were a little nervous as you were communicating, but you're a storyteller, too. You're a storyteller with your art. Uh, you're a storyteller. You just gave us two stories um, about your commute and then also about the flower. So um, I believe that, you know, we have to, as I stated earlier, we have to, as, as I was communicating to Jasmine, um, you know, invest in art and artists. Um, and SCAD is a wonderful place. Um, and then, and hard stop. But then there's also, you know, people that may not be able to make it to SCAD or afford SCAD. So we have to help people be able to afford SCAD, but also people that are right now just artists, they're just doing their thing, investing in that buying, supporting, making sure that the city buys art. When Camille and I go out and we go places, um, we'll see some art and I'll say, I like that. She'll say, Mayor, can, you know, can we buy it? And I'll be like, you know the budget. I don't know. I want it. Can I get it? I want it. You know, and she makes it happen and we, we buy art. We buy local art. Let's be clear. The mayor's office, Atlanta buys local art. Um, is, you know, and she manages the, the negotiations and the pricing of that. But um, we want to invest in artists and young artists. And, you know, I think my job now, I've been mayor, it's my first time as mayor, it's my first, and I've only been mayor f four months and a, and a little bit, but I believe that uh, my role is to say I'm interested, I like it, and to give you fuel to do more of what you do is also not, you know, it's not exclusively that I'm going to do it all is to create the spaces, the places, the conversations to, um, to make sure that you have the, the fuel to do what you do and, and then other people see that and get inspired and, um, and join, join you and want to be you, want to stand beside you. So um, yeah, I, I, I do ride down the street of Atlanta and I see mules and I'm interested in how we can have more more of them, and, and then um, and I look up and I see Fabian and Fahamu has done you know so many more, and others in this room. Um, it's important, and so I guess uh, my, my job is to tell you, it, my, my my job is to continue to promote that I'm interested in and that we want to see more. But also, while I stand next to you and all of you, um, you know, I, I once upon a time was a college student at Georgia Tech, go and then I yeah go Jackets, and then in grad school at Georgia State. Um, go Panthers. And, um, you know, Mayor Shirley Franklin was there for me when I said I wanted to be mayor at 16. And she didn't say, oh, bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> that's what we say in the South, the people that say stuff that may not work out for them. Uh, but she said, Andre, you can do anything you put your mind to. So I stand on stage with a bunch of y'all that um, I tell you, you can do any of this. Um, and you are doing it, and you can do more of it. And um, Camille's going to make it happen for you. <laughs> I 
Okay, well, Tatiana talked to us about allied health. Daisy talked to us about architecture and how we could, you know, use architecture in new and exciting ways. Erica discussed with us uh, how we could get the least of these access to better services, affordable housing and, and other services. Jasmine Wilson wants us to fund a high school for the arts. And uh, Neha Murti is going to do all the data gathering for you, but um, she talked to us about the ethical implications of genome um, studying. And then AJ wrapped it all up for us with how the artists are the heartbeat of Atlanta and how they are, you know, responsible for the creativity that is so prevalent here in Atlanta. I want to thank each and every one of you. Let's give them a round of applause. They did, they did a great job, and Mayor Dickens, thank you so much for taking time to hear the next generation of Atlantans and voters for you, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and for your policies and, and all, <laughs> um, you know, to hear them and to hear them out and to respond to them so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all, and um, I, I, again, I support you guys. Let Camille, you know, let's bring them in, talk to them some more if we need to. Um, this is event number two of six tonight, yes. so we're about to just dust the tuxedo. Run. Me and AJ must be going the same place. You fresh, you clean, I see you, tuxedo. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you all. Y'all take care. Okay.